So this lecture is basically about the exam and talking about the issues that we raise in the exam. If you've looked at it, what I've asked you all to do is to write, pick six of these 16 topics and write about 250 words on the topic that you picked. And the idea is to get a sense of the big picture rather than me focusing on one little thing and the things that interest you. My whole preoccupation this year has obviously been carbon and getting you to understand the significance of carbon, not just in your school, but in your life. And I gave an example. This is the same exam as I did last year because I really liked the results. I thought I got really interesting, thoughtful stuff. So I thought I would just do it again. Uh, this is in the, uh, the notes. I mean, in one of the earlier announcements that I made. Um, and, um, you know, basically I talked about, I wrote this as an example as sort of work, the things that preoccupy me about what's wrong with work, which I'll talk about. Uh, this student last year on food did a very interesting and lengthy response to the problem of transportation of food. And, uh, you know, many of these were very thoughtful. So what I'm going to do now, what I want to do in my presentation here, which I can't, is go through each of these topics that I did and just talk about them and give you why did I put them up, what do I think is important, and doesn't mean you have to wildly take notes because there are lots of issues about work. I just was preoccupied with one. And so these are sort of my thoughts about these subjects to get you thinking. You know, work used to be something that we did out of our homes, that people were farmers, so they did them in fields, or this was a crofter working in, uh, in Scotland, or in New York, people were in their apartments doing piecework. You know, everybody in the family sewing like mad and getting paid by the piece. Piecework was very common. And people lived on top of the shops. If they were in a vendor or anything, or a tailor or anyone, everyone usually lived on top of the shop. Until we got the Industrial Revolution, where in the Industrial Revolution, they figured out, in the first Industrial Revolution, they figured out, you know, we've got big machines, big looms, big equipment that can be run by steam engines. And most of it, because they were steam engines were big and they were fixed, they would have belts that would go to all different parts. So you'd see the shaft turning and then the belts come down. So that's what brought everyone together into one place, that they would focus around the machine that was centralized. And this is the start of the Industrial Revolution. And I'm reading a wonderful book about the Luddites, who were people who came and smashed the machines because they were taking away their livelihood and doing inferior products. But it brought everyone together in the first Industrial Revolution. The second Industrial Revolution happened in starting in the 1870s with the development of electricity and the telegraph and the electric light bulb and the elevator and surprisingly really importantly the file cabinet that what happened then is before then running a business you know when businesses were small you could have somebody just making a few notes in a ledger and with trains businesses started getting bigger and getting across the country and so you had to centralize management and that's how you got the office. And women, in particular, became experts on typewriters. There's a whole wonderful book I read about the development of typewriters and how typewriters brought women into the office because men thought they were, they, men wanted, they, they didn't think men would be good at typing because they were thinking about bigger things and moving up in the world, whereas they, women had not worked traditionally in offices, and they apparently they thought would be happy just to sit at their typewriters. So the typing pools were almost 100% women. 
And this is how you got buildings that were big buildings developed so they could bring people together to do the typing and the accounting and all of that. And surprisingly importantly, the filing. The two things were the typing and the filing that made the office happen. And filing was the bigger part of the deal. These are the records of business. So all of this technology of the 1870s and through to 2000, until about 1910, when that tall equity tower opened in New York, all of this was just how business was designed. And everybody had to travel there by subways, which they had in New York already, and by streetcars. And this is the start of the urban workplace. And the urban workplace stayed like that right through the 1960s. If you watched Mad Men, there's the typing pool in the middle of Mad Men. And this is what offices all looked like in the 60s. And, but also in the 60s, the thing that changed everything, started changing everything, was the computer. And the computer shrunk to where it became a desktop computer. And it shrunk again to where it's a laptop computer that's completely portable. And suddenly we've lost those two things that the business was all about. Three things, really. The telephone, the file cabinet, and the typewriter all moved into this one little machine. But we still had offices. And this, everybody said this was the third, the third industrial revolution. But I don't really. I think it's still the second. But what happened is that management didn't like it. Management still didn't like it. We saw it during the pandemic that everybody could work from home quite comfortably, but management doesn't like it. We're all in this stupid classroom because the university says, you've all got to be in seats, even though I think it's idiotic that you all have to drag yourself down here so you can look at computers. Uh, well, I'm talking in front of you when you could just as easily do it at home. There is a revolution happening again where more people are working on top of the store, uh, opening shops in cities, and we're living on top. I know quite a few architects who do this. They live on top of the store. But all of this should be, these systems should be designed to minimize the commute. The problem that I'm trying to address when I talk about the problem of work is that there's no point in us all going from home, getting in a subway, getting in a car, coming down to sit at a desk to do what we could do at home if the kids weren't jumping on the bed behind us. And the answer to that, of course, is satellite offices, uh, that uh, co-working places, places where you could have distributed offices all over. Because what we have to think about in the future is designing for the 15-minute city where everything that you need is within a 15-minute walk. The stuff you need to shop, the places you need to work, uh, the places you go to school, uh, everything should be able to be in this great concept of the 15-minute city, walkable in your neighborhood. Now, when I was working until last January for a very, very big company in New York City. They couldn't make me come into the office, but everybody in New York had to go to the office because they thought it inspires creativity. And what it really did, everybody I worked with there just said, it just wastes time. So if I was writing about my section here on work, I would be writing again about my obsession that the office is dead that we shouldn't be going to the office, that the lecture like this is dead. What we're doing here was done in 1660 in Bologna, in the first university, where because books weren't printed, you had one lecturer sitting up at the top, at the front, reading from that one book, and everybody making notes because they couldn't afford the book and you couldn't get the book. So it was all about sitting in a lecture hall, not much different from this, uh, and making notes from some guy who's reading from a book. And here we are 500 years later, 400 years later, doing the whole thing because the education system hasn't figured out a better way to do it. I mean, I don't know. Did you learn as much during the pandemic as you learned dragging your asses down here? Probably, no, you, th you think you'll learn more coming down? Okay. 
It's an interesting discussion. See, again, in the computer world, it's uh, nothing to being critical of you, but like, I honestly, I look around and half the people in the class are looking at their phones and looking at their computer screens while I'm talking, and I've only got 25% of the class here, and that's why it sometimes gets frustrating. But I know you're all making notes what I'm saying, so that's what you're doing. So again, I'm going through all 16 of these, so I'm just going to talk a bit about every one, about the preoccupations. To just the idea here is to have you thinking what you might write about when you're doing the exam. And the water is a really interesting one, because if I was teaching a normal sustainable design class, I'd be talking about water, I'd be talking about materials, I'd be talking about all of these other things that go into sustainable design. But I've got carbon on the brain. It's such a big issue. It's dominating everything. You don't learn enough about it in your other courses, so I tend to preoccupy, be preoccupied with the carbon issue. But there are all kinds of issues with water in everything we do. And I just put this together by grabbing sort of guardian headlines in this water section that right now water is a weapon of war, cutting it off in Gaza, so that basically people are, are dying of thirst. Uh, water supply, fresh water demand is going to outstrip supply by 40%. By 2030, you know, in Saudi Arabia, they have to use huge amounts of their natural gas to run their massive desalination plants, so their water is high carbon. Um, water, we're running out of it everywhere except us very fortunate people living around the Great Lakes. But I wouldn't be surprised by 2030 if we're not having major, major battles with the Americans, because right now we're all on a water sharing treaty that no water can be taken from the Great Lakes outside of the natural area where they would get water from the Great Lakes. Like you're not allowed to ship it to Colorado. And what we're going to find that because Colorado because uh, California, because Nevada, because of all of these southwestern states have no water and they get it from the Colorado River, that the Americans are going to start saying, well, there's lots of water in Lake Superior and Lake Erie and we're just going to start taking some of them. Even though there's a treaty with Canada that says they're not allowed to, they're already sneaking little bits about it and playing with the borders and that. And it's long been said that in North America, the next wars will be fought over water, and it's probably going to happen. And the water is not even that good. You know what forever chemicals are. These are the coming environmental issue. Uh, petrofluorocarbons, they were basically developed uh, they're really long-lasting plastics that if you have Gore-Tex, Gore-Tex is made with PTFA, Teflon frying pans, non-slip surfaces, all of these things. And it's in a lot of stuff. It's in food wrappers, it's in cosmetics, it's in all kinds of things, and they're just beginning to find out how harmful it is. It was always thought they're harmless, that they just go through your body, but they're not harmless. Uh, water stress, a quarter of the world's population doesn't have enough. And city dwellers don't have safe water. There's lots of people who are still getting it in old lead pipes. There's lots of water treatment plants that aren't any good. Uh, it's the, the UN warns the, of humanity's lifeblood amid worse, worsening water scarcity. Now, we in Toronto, for an inter as I mentioned, I think, in an earlier presentation, have issues with water in that we get our water out of Lake Ontario, and it goes into the wonderful R.C. Harris water treatment plants and the other treatment plants. And then we take all our wastewater, plus all the wastewater from all the communities around Toronto, and we pipe it all down to Ashbridge's Bay and purify it, sort of, and put it back in the lake. And so it all gets, whatever's in it gets diluted, but then, you know, five kilometers apart, we're putting our stuff in, we're taking it out. They take out almost everything, but what they can't get out are things like antibiotics, because they're dissolved, and hormones, like birth control pills, like half of the hormone in a birth control pill goes out the other end and into the water. And so that we're getting teensy little bits. When you drink water, you're getting these hormones, 
which are causing problems in men. Men should not be taking birth control hormones and causing problems in prepubescent women and basically might well be part of the, uh, the um, whole fertility crisis that, much of, that we're having. So, you know, there's talk that we'll have to spend billions and billions of dollars to drive a giant pipe up to Georgian Bay because we can't be comfortable drinking the water that we're getting out of Lake Ontario. And we've got some of the best water you have anywhere, but they know and they've told me they can't do anything about antibiotics and hormones that are in that water in incredibly small quantities. Yes? It's mostly the pill, but it's, there's hormones in all kinds of drugs and all kinds of, uh, but it's mostly that. And antibiotics is mostly, you know, people take antibiotics they don't need and animal antibiotics from in farms is a huge issue. That's water, the big problem there. That was issue two. Issue three is air, air quality. Um, indoor and outdoor air quality. Indoor air quality is something that is not regulated, that hardly anyone talks about, and that in fact in many cases is really awful, especially at this time of year when the windows are, start, are closed and people are, uh, if they're in a cold house and you get moisture condensing on the walls, you get mold, we've got mold, we've got dust, we've got uh, fire retardants that come out of the, your furniture, and uh, if you've got a gas stove, you've got nitrogen oxide and you've got particulates. And these are all big issues that nobody cared about. Nobody has any standards for particulates inside a house. There aren't any regulations about it. And the reason being that it was always really hard. People used to smoke. And if you smoke, you have shitty air quality. And so, you know, what could they do? Now that almost no people don't smoke as much as they used to, and not that many people smoke inside, uh, you begin to see what comes out of the gas stoves, what's coming out of the paints, the volatile organic compounds, what's coming out now that we're getting concerned with the, the PFASs. These are all issues, indoor quality, and we have to start outdoors to deal with the particulate pollution. I mean, when I look at all of the condos that are hanging over the Gardner Expressway, where you know you just open the window and you're breathing in the particulates and the exhaust that come primarily from cars, from diesel exhaust, from gas exhaust, and from tire and brake wear. I think that you know it's absolutely a criminal thing that nobody, none of those towers should have been allowed within hundreds of meters of the highway, and like people are just hanging over them, and we have to get serious about this. Animal agriculture is also a problem, but the main thing is the automobile industry and generating electricity. And um, all of these are not only putting out carbon, which we know is a problem that we've talked about, but they're putting out particulates. And just saying we'll go to electric cars won't work either because electric cars are heavier, which means there's more tire wear, which means there's more particulates from the tire wear, which people are finding now is a much bigger issue than anyone ever thought. I mean, I took this picture in uh, London and you know the sky was orange in London and that was not from industry, that was from uh, cars. And this was just in the New York Times the day before yesterday talking about why we're breathing such terrible air that the architects and the engineers never, they, for, to save energy in the 70s, they dialed back the requirement for fresh air and they had more recirculated air. And so we're breathing more and more of each other's carbon dioxide, more and more of the stuff that should be exhausted and fresh air brought in. I used to bring my carbon dioxide detector into this classroom and I would say last year and this year, if it goes above 900, we're leaving. Then I said, okay, it goes above 1,000, we're leaving. And then I just gave up. And it, they cranked up, because I complained, they cranked up the air circulation in here to the point that I can barely hear you guys because it's like an airplane going, you know, it's really loud. 
and I have terrible hearing. I have these hearing aids that I adjust and say, let's get rid of the w wind noise, let's get rid of this, let's get rid of that. And I still have trouble hearing some of the presentations. And that's because they've cranked up the air quality, but it's still not right, which is why there are two air purifiers here. I complained about that too. And so they brought in a second. Um, new rules just came out that crank up the ventilation in school buildings like this, that it should be eight air changes per hour. To get to eight air changes per hour, they would probably have to replace the ventilation systems in every building on campus except the new nursing school next to the interior design school that I know was built to the new standards. And they're not going to do that. They don't have the money. The government's not going to pay. So all of the health people, all of the engineers, the ASHRAE standard now, eight t air changes per hour, and we're sitting and we're probably getting three, which means this is not healthy air. And this is something that we've all got to face. Okay, where are we? Number four, food. Food is really interesting, not just from a carbon point of view. This is sort of the carbon emissions from producing food and supply chain food, bringing the food uh, to our places. Now you remember on all of our presentations this morning, transportation. Transportation is surprisingly lower than we think. These people, these, uh, this study is showing, if you look, wow, on beef, producing it on almost anything, the supply chain, processing, transport, packaging, and retail is tiny. Now, I actually went and called these people out and had discussions with them, these poor and nemesec people who did these studies because when they calculated transportation, they did it with just looking at the mileage and the carbon and the fuel per mile, the diesel fuel per mile, and they ignored refrigeration. And I called them out on this and said, well, maybe it would make a little bit of difference. It actually makes a huge difference. Refrigerators, refrigerated trucks, about 30% of the energy in the truck goes to running the refrigeration. But more importantly, they leak refrigerants, lots of refrigerants. And refrigerants are a serious greenhouse gas. So I think these are wrong and all of those orange ones should be doubled. But there's the problem of carbon from dealing with this. And you can see where all of the emissions come from. Uh, they come from livestock and fish farms. 30% of our carbon emissions come from, uh, from cows and from fish farms, which shocked me. Uh, crops for food, only 21%. Land use for livestock, 16%. And the transport supply chain up at the top. This is the chart I used when I wrote my book about living the 1.5 degree lifestyle, which you know, because this one it's based in calories rather than a kilogram. You know, a kilogram of cheese is gonna have a different footprint than a kilogram of lettuce. So what you really wanted to know is the issue per, you know, say thousand calories. Food calories are, that we talk about are really kilocalories, but we just call them calories. So this was the really surprising thing. Like we knew beef was high, but why are prawn or shrimp so high? Why would shrimp be so high? Well, because they've come halfway around the world. They mostly, mostly come from Thailand and from uh, that part of the world, and so there's a huge amount of shipping. Lamb, it's a ruminant like a cow, so it's got a lot. What was always shocking was tomatoes. Why are tomatoes so high? Well, tomatoes, which you think are a nice healthy vegetable, or they're actually a fruit, but anyhow, they are invariably, except for one month of the year when you get them in August, every other tomato that you get is either a hothouse tomato, which is heated with natural gas, or it's been transported from Mexico or California. So they've got a huge transport footprint. So that's why tomatoes, unless you eat them in August, are really, really high in carbon. And cheese, milk, everything else is just, if it comes from a cow, it's got a high carbon footprint. When we were on my, my little program, the only meat that we could sort of, that we sort of ate regularly was uh, chicken 
and pork because they're actually low and I had no beef for a year, no burgers for a year. I've had one or two since. But there are other issues that are also involved besides just carbon. I know I always have carbon on my brain. But if you look at land use, the amount of land that it takes to raise cows is insane. Look at this. It's like off the scale compared to everything else. Land use, land use required to produce 1,000 calories of food, 119 meters for 1,000 calories of food, that's like two hamburgers. Uh, needs 119 meters. You know, you realize the importance of eating less lamb and eating less beef. It eats up huge amounts of space. It causes huge amounts of deforestation as they cut down the Amazon to make more land to raise more cows. Yes? Does that include the that Yes. Okay. Yes, it's all the la land use impact. So you want to eat down here in the vegetables, in the nuts. And like everything else, it's unevenly distributed, where you see that like much of the world is food insecure. They don't have enough to eat. Uh, we up at the top in that nice color, you know, all of these, you know, we have I'm surprised that the United States is worse than Canada, but there we are. Vast portions of the population uh, can't afford a healthy diet because food has gotten expensive, and so they basically are eating some basic staples, but not enough balanced diet. And you see that through almost all of Africa and India. The other thing we do is that we just waste incredible amounts of food that the world average household waste. You know, you always think, oh, the waste is happening behind the store or in the field. But if you look at it, the world, you know, 74% of the waste is then we leave stuff at the back of the fridge and it rots, and or in the cupboard and it rots, or it expires. 31% of it is out of the home consumption, and 15% and is in the fields. And again, the other issue becomes one of fresh water with agriculture. Once again, shrimp seem to be the worst. I don't know why shrimp are in fresh water issues. I thought they were in salt water, but clearly I don't know what, and farmed fish. Uh, again, tomatoes really high on water intake. Um, milk. Again, you want to eat further down and more vegetarian, except for tomatoes that are a problem. So it's not, when I talk about food, this is to trying to point out that it's not just, it's not just the carbon, but there are the issues of water and land use. Clothing is an issue, and here I'm using a few of my students work in their infographics from last year, which a lot of people spent a lot of time on clothing last year. This year you all seem to have concentrated on food. But like even the box that they get the shoes in has uh, 200 grams. Why? And it's all in the printing. It was so interesting to see this that the biggest impact was the printing of Nike on the box, which, you know, who needs it? Who sees it? Ugg boots. 48 kilograms in a pair of boots. A pair of jeans, 32 kilograms. Food, I mean, clothing has a huge carbon footprint. A t-shirt, 12 grams, 12 kilograms. What was the t-shirt today? 68 because of the transportation. This is why I, you have to look at your transportation again. Running shoes, only 14. But when you get off that, you see that the carbon footprint of fashion, for some reason in Australia, is ridiculously high. Uh, Canada, the, then Japan, then the United States. Um, if we, we've got to get down in 2030, 
Every part of our life, we have to use less stuff, but this is where we've got to go. So in Canada, we've got to cut our carbon consumption, our clothing consumption, from 336 to a third of what it is now. And the lifestyle footprint, you know, we're just so far off in Canada. And it's all fast fashion. Very few companies do much about it. I've mentioned before, Allbirds is one that basically gives you the number for all of their stuff. I just, they're doing less than they used to. I think they found nobody cared. But you know, they give us all the math on all of their shoes. So they're, these particular shoes are 6.77. But as the C40 study said, you know, we've got to, on clothing and textiles, we have to drop again by two thirds. Have to cut back our consumption by two thirds to hit 2030 targets. And I think I showed you this before, which was the wonderful take the jump program out of the UK, where they suggest that, you know, dress with, uh, dress retro, uh, keep items of clothing, for, uh, uh, don't buy more than three items per year. But even buying dressing retro has a footprint, has a problem. The gentrification of thrifting means that the people who used to go to the thrift stores, the value village, because they could afford it, are getting priced out of the market because everybody's going and buying everything they can at value village because they like the retro clothing now and people are reselling it and they're calling them bad persons after going to the thrift shop and then putting it online. Now again, the point of this exercise here is these are all the items on the exam and it's basically to get you thinking about, well, why is this here, what is there, but it's, you know, this isn't what you write about or anything, this is just me trying to draw a little bit of a framework around it. So housing, we all think of the house in North America as the thing that we rent or the thing that we buy, either a house or a condo. But there's all kinds of different ways. We've got this huge housing crisis now. How can we deal with this housing crisis? You know, in Europe, you can actually buy uh, an apartment from Ikea. They started this program called Beauclock um, because what was happening in Scandinavia is that women basically have given up on men and the many, many of them are living on their own and having kids on their own and there was no real uh, place designed for them to live. And so Skanska and a major development company in Ikea developed Beauclock, which was a type of housing that were small groups of units that were set around a communal area where kids could play, where all the moms could deal with them and collectively help, help bring them all up as a group. The old line, it takes a village to raise a kid. And Ikea basically developed the Beauclock uh, system for this because the huge proportion of Swedish women who had no interest in getting married. And uh, so that this it's a whole trend that's happening there and that I wouldn't be surprised will spread um, for people who want to live in the home, uh, home of their own, so relatively economical. And there's all kinds of different models of housing that don't involve, you know, gee, I've got a ton of money and I'm going to buy something. There are co-ops all over, like Bedzet is a really interesting one. It's one of the greenest projects <coughs> that was ever built. Toronto was a pioneer in this. We had uh, Spruce Court and Bain Avenue co-ops that back in the 20s and the 30s, they were building better homes for working men and women so that people could live and pay rent and have enough money. And they built really nice housing. And they continued doing this right into the 70s where they built the St. Lawrence Project where they were building co-ops. The federal government was financing them. They're still happening. This one was built relatively recently in, um, in, on King Street, which was for restaurant workers. 
and it's a big co-op for people who work in restaurants and who otherwise couldn't afford to live in Toronto. In Germany and Austria, they have these things called Baggruppen. Um, Baggruppen are basically a bunch of people get together and say, okay, we're going to hire a builder and build a building for ourselves. And they go to the government, which controls much of the land, and says, got any land? And the government says, yes, we have a piece of land here. Let's open it to you guys to give us the best proposal. And so the group would get together. This group that built this building uh, was actually put together by an architect. And they gathered up enough people who said, yes, we'll pay this much rent. And then they go to the government and say to the government, <coughs> we'll pay you this much rent for the land. And the government says, that looks good. OK, uh, go ahead and build your project. And that's what they do. And this is why in Germany and Austria, 80% of the people live in rental housing because the government promotes it and they give them long leases and they give you so you can stay you can't be evicted and this is the kind of thing that we have to do here if you think about this housing crisis that we've got so we need more co-ops we need more co-living co-housing and more baugruppen which is sort of german for co-housing What we don't need are shipping container housings, which are one of the, you see them all the time. Architectural magazines are full of shipping container housing. My father was a pioneer in the container industry, and I did my thesis in architecture school out of shipping containers. But you would never have people sitting in a shipping container because they were expensive then. And containers are part of a system for moving all around the world. They've got these things called corner castings that are standard on every container so they can go by ship and by truck. And the containers were designed to move, not to sit there and be turned into a house. And there's 10 times as much steel as you need in them. And the floors are treated with insecticides, which are toxic. And the paints on them are designed to go in the ocean. And they're completely toxic. And the idea that anyone would actually live inside an old shipping container is insane. They're also designed for freight, not people. The dimension is just wrong. And yet people have this fascination with it. You know, again, my thesis was on them. Uh, I played with them. My first job was in shipping containers. I grew up around them. And everybody said years later, why didn't you be a shipping container architect? I said, because I know shipping containers, and it's stupid, and nobody should live in a shipping container. And, you know, I may have missed a great opportunity because the architects who became sort of shipping container architects and that got in all the magazines, and it's very popular stuff. But it's just wrong. It's just silly. It's sometimes what you're seeing now is units specifically built to take advantage of the container handling system, but they're not built to go on ships. They're not built with toxic materials. They're like pieces that go together to make hotels because you can do a hotel room sort of in those dimensions. There are some things where if you think of it as a system involving handling as well as the box itself, there are some uses that make sense, but not this. And this I just put in because it's totally silly, which was the scheme for a hydrogen-powered, all-electric, uh, ridiculous solar-powered, hydrogen and wind-powered. Um, I shouldn't have put them in because they're just completely silly. This is not the future of housing. Transportation, we did a lecture on it early in the season, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about transportation. But, you know, there's my St. Clair streetcar. The thing about transportation is we're car brained. The whole North America is car brained. And, you know, they think this was the, uh, this was the American dream in the 1960s. You got your car, you got your boat, and you got your big house. And this is the American dream in the 2020s. You got your car and your a bigger car, a bigger boat, and a bigger house. It's exactly the same thing. And uh, this is what we have to get away with, for, away from, for all the reasons we've discussed of excess consumption, excess pollution, and you know, excess money required to do it. And electric cars aren't going to save us, and autonomous cars aren't going to save us, and uh, 
and shared cars aren't going to save us because it's all the same picture when you look at what happens on the roads. We don't need electric cars. We need to get rid of cars, as we've talked about as I went on about in the class. And this table that shows, it's 10 years old, you know, the deadly impact of cars that you look at the leading causes of death due to road transport. In all of these, heart disease, because people aren't getting exercise, delis are, are years of livable life lost. So if your life is shortened because you get sick, uh, that's a D-A-L-Y, I forget what it's, uh, uh, it's the sort of years of life lost because of this. And all of these diseases, stroke, uh, respiratory infections, lung cancer, and all of these, not to mention road injury here, are directly attributable to cars in terms of their pollution that they cause, the fact that they run you over, the lack of exercise for people. These are huge, huge numbers. Now, this was the favorite street that I saw in Berlin which is the way I think every street should be, that you know, you start, you've got a sidewalk for people walking. You've got a bike lane for people biking. You've got a sitting area for all the signage and that for people waiting for transit. You've got transit, and then you've got car. And you don't see a lot of parking here. So you know, what we do with our roads is we give away half the space for parking, we have give the rest of it to cars. If we're lucky, we get a bike lane. And if we're really lucky, nobody's parked in the bike lane. And um, you know, we have to rethink transportation so that we can get people out of cars. And like I have in the back, back root of the classroom here, get them onto e-bikes, which I think is the best way to get around. And I have this vision, I, th I always have my favorite slide, which is Stockholm in 1928. Stockholm's a pretty cold place. The climate's not that different from ours. And what do you see? You see almost no cars. You see everybody walking and on bikes, and you see transit. And I always think that, you know, this could be um, Toronto in 2028 if we wanted it to be. How are we doing? Okay, we're doing fine. Inequality is something that I wanted to talk more about this year and I didn't get to, which is the problem that most of our problems that we have in the world today are problems caused by an incredibly small percentage of people. I mean, this, this tweet from Kylie Jenner last year uh, caused an uproar because I forget who her husband is or that, but they both have private jets. And she actually put this out on Instagram. You want to take your jet or you want to take my jet? And the world went insane because of the obvious, disgraceful, conspicuous consumption of this couple with two private jets and a Rolls Royce parked in front of it and just saying, gee, which one will we take? She took that one down real fast. But the problem is that you see in the famous champagne glass, this is an older one, that you know the richest 10%, and the richest 10% is everyone who's earning more than 45,000 Canadian uh, uh, on, on a worldwide standard in that, is uh, responsible for 49% of lifestyle emissions. And lifestyle emissions, as I explained before, are the emissions that we have control over, how we live, how we get around. And just two days ago, The Guardian came out and said, well, it's worse. That was older. That the richest 1%, now the richest 1%, that's people making over the equivalent of $150,000 a year Canadian, are responsible for 66% of all emissions. The richest 1% were responsible for 16% of global emissions, the same as the emissions of the poorest 66%. And they redid the tulip in that. So you can see that the richest 1% are responsible, for, the richest 10% are responsible for 50% of emissions. And that's all of us.
and this is where we've got to be. This is where we've got to be at 2.5 tons per person on average in the world in 2030. And the richest are 77 times that. 77 times above the, two, the 2030 compatible level of 2.8 tons, they say. And so this is the problem. How do we get them to do something? Well, you know, you set up guillotines in the town square, I don't know. Do we put in carbon taxes that are incredibly high? Uh, the richest emissions of the richest 10%, the same as the rest of the world. The richest 10, 1% are responsible, double the carbon emissions. Uh, and their consumption's going up. You know, the richest 10%, richest 1% at 70 tons per year. Richest 10% at like 20. And the poorest 50%, like they're down where we have to be. So again, what's this showing? Total consumption emissions, oh, 1990. That's, we'll skip that one. And it's clear, you know, that the top 1% in the America, in the United States, are the worst. Uh, but we in Canada, the top 10%, you can see, are way up there, like almost 30. Our average is 15. Sometimes I get a little crazy with the graphs. I'm sorry, I can't even remember where they are. And here you see where it all is. A lot of it with the richest 1% is all in aviation. This is flying. And the richer you get, the more you fly, and flying has a huge carbon footprint. So that's where we're getting the problem. The energy footprint, deciles, they're using all that. And uh, it's almost all when you look at that. So much of it is flying. International flights. OK. Travel and tourism. This is another thing, you know, I, I have such mixed feelings about this because I love to travel. And I went to Venice, I mean, you could barely get onto the Rialto Bridge, there are so many tourists. The experience is not like it was, and Venice, of course, is being mucked up by all those cruise ships. Um, aviation, again, we fly so much. You can understand Australians being the worst in the world down there because they're sort of on this giant out island in the middle of nowhere and they have to fly to get anywhere. But America's up there as well because they have such a terrible uh, train system and that everybody has to fly even just to get around the country. Europe is much better because they don't have to fly as much, but not much better. And, you know, adjusted for tourism, we have to, Canadians travel a lot. We fly south a lot in the winter, go to Florida. So our tourists, our, our emissions are pretty high. Again, not as bad as uh, Australia. In Britain, they're really high because everybody there flies away for the weekend. The flights are so cheap. You spend $10 and you can get to Spain. It's insane how cheap they are. I, when I, I was, um, used to go every year to lecture in, Port in Portugal. And I would fly to Porto for 12 euros. And then I'd have to take the train from Porto to Aveiro, which is like a 40 minute train ride. And it would cost 40 euros. It cost me four times as much to take a short train ride within Portugal as it did to fly to Portugal because of the weird structure of the British airplane system. And carbon emissions adjusted for tourism, you can see they're high, and we're among the worst offenders. And this used to be something that was just like the 1% or the even one-tenth of 1% that would do the flying. But now it's changed. I'll get into that. This is a bit out of order. And the airline industry says, oh, we're going to clean our, our act. We're going to have sustainable aviation fuels, which are made from everything from pig fat to uh, ethanol to uh, electrofuels. And they've made all of these promises. And they've not met any of them. They uh, make promises. They say the target. Nope, didn't meet it. Nope, didn't get it. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. They're just 
and they just keep making the targets weaker and thinner. In 25, they said, we'll have 10% by 2017. Now in, 28, in 2018, they'll have 2% by 2026. And now they're promising hydrogen plants uh, and things like that. But these are not going to work because hydrogen, you need lots of it. And you need to have it liquid hydrogen. And you don't want to be flying with giant tanks of liquid hydrogen in your airplane. And they don't have that much energy compared to jet fuel. And the number of flights now is insane. Again, it used to be something that a few people did, and a few people who were actually very wealthy would do it, and you know, flying was fun, and these I know are all Swedish first class passengers and that. And then in the 60s, the Boeing 747 came along, and it was originally designed again for the luxury clientele. Gee, wasn't that gonna be beautiful? But what happened is that they had the whole lower level where they crammed everybody in and suddenly flying became something much more popular. We could all do it. Now it was no longer a thing for the 1%, it became a thing for the 10%, which includes us. And we're doing a lot of flying. But the thing is, it's still only the 10% that's flying. Only 20% of the population in the world has ever been in an airplane that 80% of people are poor and they don't fly. If you're in South America and you're poor, if you're in Africa, if you're poor, if you're in Asia, if you're poor, they have not they traditionally flown. And if they did ever fly, they fly extremely rarely. And there are lots of Indians in Canada who fly back to India, but they don't do it like on a weekend. Um, and you know, flying's really gotten miserable since the pandemic. You know, there are so many people who are having fights, and unruly. Uh, you know, it's just a serious issue. Flying has become not fun, and of course, all of the problems from pollution of it. And you know, now what the one percent and the one tenth of one percent are doing are they are doing much, much more private flying. Private jets are growing like mad. Booking trips on private jets, even if you don't own the, pl of the private jet, is growing like mad. And this is a huge problem because they put out 40 times the amount of carbon per kilometer per passenger uh, than a regular plane does. And so this has got to be regulated and controlled and they should be taxed out of existence. Now plastics, this is the next one. I'm getting through these. Plastics is one that we just discussed last week, so I don't want to spend a lot of time with it. You know the story about we used to export it to China. We can't export it to China anymore. Uh, so the amount of exported plastic went way down, and the stuff is piling up everywhere. All of these, your water bottles that we talked about today, it's not just the carbon footprint of the water bottles, it's what the hell we do with them. And I love showing this series of shots that for from Washington in a period of three days when the government shut down and there was nobody picking up the garbage in the public areas, you know, the whole city was just overwhelmed with garbage because garbage collection is done by the taxpayers. We all pay for it so that these people could buy takeout food as tourists. I mean, this is a huge cost that we never even think of, that Washington was just buried in waste in three days. And we know that, as we did from that lecture, that there are all these different plastics and that they're and they're calling here for a transition to a new plastic society with a circular economy, but it's a fantasy. Because as we know, I showed this before, only 14% is collected, uh, only 8% is actually recycled into something, downcycled, and only 2% is closed loop, where a water bottle might be turned back into a water bottle. And the vast majority of it is landfilled or it leaks into the environment. Only 2% of the plastics production is reused for the same or similar products. And that's a problem because if you say, I'm going to take plastic bottles and I'm going to turn them into clothing, then you've got to get more virgin plastic to make up for what went into the clothing. And so clothing should be recycled into clothing, bottles should be recycled into bottles, instead of 95% of it lost. And, these fant and it, pretty soon, you know, there will be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish. 
So they want to turn it into a circular system where it all gets picked up, but it doesn't work because it doesn't all get picked up because we're all slobs and we don't put it in the right place and it's too expensive uh, for the government to pick it all up. And so it doesn't happen. And so we talk about this circular economy, but the circular economy doesn't work because of the energy input to make it circular. It's not circularity, it has to be closed looped. I showed you these just last week. What they're training us to do, again, this is the next step. Remember that poster from America Recycles Day a few years ago where they said, we want, I want to, the bottle wants to be a bench? Well, look at what they're saying now. This is really, really interesting. Society needs to stop thinking of plastic as waste but as a renewable resource that needs to be disposed of properly. So what they're saying, they're training you now to say, oh, this plastic bottle, which is why the amount of plastic keeps going up and the recycling area down at the bottom barely turns. And you'll keep hearing about circular plastics and chemical processing and chemical recycling, but it's all a sham. They've hijacked the idea of the central circular economy, and it doesn't work. It's like, as one Chevron rep said, it's like figuring out chemical recycling is like going to Mars. It's a dangerous deception. Then there's my favorite that I've written two books about, which is reduce consumption. And I love this poster that I saw where, you know, all of the things you hear about, you know, turn out the lights, prevent waste, turn down the thermostat, reduce, uh, refuse your shopping bags, all of this, all of this, you can cross them all out and, you know, just stop consuming so much, reduce consumption, stop buying shit, use less stuff. This is the architectural, this is the design one where, you know, we first talk, build nothing, do we really have to build anything? Build less, you know, maybe we fix what we've got. Build clever, maybe build it out of wood. Build efficiently, uh, use the materials in the, uh, as carbon efficient materials. Or as Will Arnold just said, you know, all of that just goes into one big lump. Use less stuff. Then what you use left, you know, specify low carbon stuff. And then with what the teeny little bit you might offset. This is what I've called and what the Samuel Alexander called a sufficiency economy of having those things necessary for a uh, decent life. You know, a life based on modest material and energy needs, but rich in other dimensions. A life of frugal abundance, about creating an economy based on sufficiency, knowing how much is enough to live well, and discovering that it is enough, enough is plenty. And this study, you know, looked at all of these things, you know, Instead of a private car, you want public transportation. Instead of meat, you want to eat according to season and more vegetables uh, for housing, you know, smaller living spaces and for goods and services, you know, low emission goods and services, sharing more. And these are the things that we have to do. And these are the way they suggest we can get there. You can regulate them like high taxes on private jets. Uh, we can have carbon taxes and high carbon things. We can nudge uh, and, you know, we can communicate. And it can make a huge difference. So we have to improve, make more efficient buildings. We have to shift uh, transportation and we have to avoid certain things. And I won't go into all of these. This is too much. Just going into all of the different things we can do to save carbon out of the IPCC. It's bored enough. I did mention the C40s before, talking about you know people in cities. The things we have to do is sort of reduce the number of stuff we buy, uh, dietary changes, uh, reduce number of flights, improve material efficiency, reduce car ownership, keep our computers longer. And they set standards that we might have to do. I've said this already too many times, won't go into it again. You know, reduce clothing items, reduce waste from the chain, reduce number of flights, sustainable aviation fuel. When this was actually proposed by the mayor of London that the people look at this, uh, you know, the, the C40 city, they thought, you know, they, um, 
basically started attacking the mayor who had nothing to do with it. But it's this live the, the take the jump people I've told you, which took that C40 study and basically turned it into a, ga they gamified it here, uh, getting us to each try to end clutter, uh, holiday local, eat green, dress retro, travel fresh, and change the system, all totaling up with there's less stuff, more joy, which might be a great mantra. Live for joy, not for stuff. It's not about sacrifice. It's about living our lives more fully. And what have we got here? I threw everything in the pot here. It's the IPCC. Um, this was just the point. Again, you see so much pessimism. If you're reading the newspapers right now, you're reading constantly, oh my God, three degrees. Oh my God, there's nothing what we can do. Oh my God, you know, we could do five degrees. Like everything is dire and everybody's saying we failed. And I can't stand here in front of you and say it's impossible, it's dire, we failed. Because it's not true. We have not yet failed, and we know what to do. We've talked about it in the whole class. It had a lot to do with the sufficiency idea. Uh, the IPCC laid out all these things. The blue ones are easy, the red ones are hard. You know, wind energy is easy, and it's doing fabulously. We know what to do. And, you know, like, for, in, for, for mobility, work from home, take public transit, electric vehicles. For buildings, uh, lifestyle and behavioral changes, like live more in apartments, uh, energy efficiency building envelopes. Electricity, we know what to do. Food, we know what to do, to eat less meat. This is the thing that we know what to do. The question is, how do we motivate people to do it? And this is the problem that I've obviously wrestled with, but I would never say all is lost because we, it isn't. And it's this SER framework I've talked about before that you know, we design our lives around a combination of more efficient buildings, uh, powered and built out of renewable materials, but the big one is sufficiency. How much do we need? Now we're getting really close to the end of the thing on the uh, exam and there was one called tech and communication and I was yesterday yesterday when I was putting the slideshow together I thought why is this here what do I want to say and so I had to run around and dig stuff up that was relevant to text and communication tech and communication and one thing last year there was all this thing about you know the carbon footprint of Netflix is so high and streaming videos, the carbon footprint of data is so high and we have to do something to reduce the carbon footprint of data. But the thing is, when I talk about flying and the carbon footprint of flying, which is like 4% of all carbon emissions, we know that a really small proportion of the world is doing it, like you know, 20% of the world is causing the, 90% of the flying emissions. So it's a small bunch of rich people. When you go to data, when you go to tech and data, you've got like uh, nine tenths of the world now has a phone. People have a phone before they have a toilet. People have, are dependent on this and it's lifted so many lives um, that, they, you know, that they actually have these tools that they never had before. So whenever anybody says like, what is the, the carbon footprint of technology is 2% of global emissions, I say yes, but look at how they're shared. You know, and every time I watch a movie on Netflix, it might be that in the old days I got in the car and drove out to the theater. And so, you know, it's actually in some ways reducing consumption. So it's another thing that I just get upset about when people say this. And they're now, now all talking about it that you know, they say here, this is the thing, you know, the energy used for digital consumption is emits the same as the airline industry. And yes, but it's nine, 10 times as many people are benefiting from it. And so this is why I think a statement like that is completely wrong because it's missing the per capita consumption and who's doing it. I remember when I was used to work on elections and um, I would do canvassing around and I'd go into some really poor areas of town and I'd see that they had bigger and better televisions than we had in our house. 
And the first reaction was, well, how can these people afford such big televisions? And the people would say, how do you spend your time? What do these people do for leisure and entertainment or anything else? All they have is their TV because they can't afford anything else. And so that really put the picture to me that you know, we can't sit here and say this. You know, what the very rich do when they get in an airplane is very different from what people do in the cell phone. I remember writing an article that I got in a lot of flack about that, um, that refugees getting across borders would say that our phone is more important than our food. And people say, well, you've got to eat. And they were saying as refugees, I've got to communicate. So um, this is something you should not let people say this. Now that artificial intelligence is coming, it's taking up a lot of data, but companies are getting better at that. And dealing with it and powering their data centers are getting better all the time. And then finally, there's resilience. And this, again, I just pulled away a lot of pictures and just show, you know, I don't want to end with resilience. I'm getting close to the end, but I just basically disaster after disaster after rainfall and fires and ice storms and floods and more floods and more floods and more hurricanes and more fires and uh, and uh, you know people in the Canadian fires uh, people in the West who wanted to deny in Alberta who wanted to deny that climate change is a problem said all these fires are arson and they weren't arson. And, but like this is what you will hear, the anti-climate people saying, oh, it's, it's arson. They're not. And one person was saying that you know, they're lasers. They were laser space weapons uh, starting fires in California. You know, people will say anything to say that the climate isn't happening. And you know, our Canadian conservative politicians are exactly like that. And you know, they, they want to cancel the carbon tax, but the carbon tax is given back to us. That's a check to me from the government as a rebate for the carbon tax. And since I don't buy a lot of gasoline and I don't drive a car, that's money in my pocket from the government. Don't you guys take away my carbon tax. So, well, you know, it's true, it's a problem that we're heading to two or three and politicians dither and that's criminal, but we, we're seeing these things come to pass, but we know what we can do, and I refuse to sit here and be so negative about it. Finally, I'm doing education. It's the last one. And the problem, again, that I've always complained about is that you're here in what third and fourth year school taking a sustainable design class that should be a f baked into everything I think that you learn from first year, not a third year option where I have 10 lectures and I can't possibly squeeze it all in. And it's frustrating because we have to recognize that this is a serious issue and young people are taking to the streets and are protesting. And in Britain, they're all getting arrested. But we have to take action, not only out in the streets, but we have to take action in the schools. And it's not just kids. These are friends of mine. In the UK, there's this group, Architects, Architects Can, Architects for Climate Action, and they're professions and students. And they're very, very big on getting the schools involved uh, with their whole plan that, you know, we've got to decarbonize now. We need ecological regeneration to fix the planet. Cultural transformation where we all understand the importance about it. We need to take action. And my favorite slide, carbon literacy must be embedded in our education, which obviously it isn't. So that's it. Next week, I will put together a short a lecture on you know, LEED and Living Building Challenge and WELL and all of the various building standards and stuff. But it won't be, it won't be a tremendously long lecture. Uh, and I'm hoping we'll catch up with the presentations.